So everyone, I'm really pleased to say that we are joined here today by our first speaker, who is Professor Dr. Simon Zagorski Thomas, who is a professor at the London College of Music, University of West London. He is founder and chair of the 21st Century Music Practice Research Network with over 250 members in 30 countries and series editor of the Cambridge Elements series of the same name. He was the co-founder of the Art of Record Production Conference and until 2017 was also co-chair for the study of the Art of Record Production. He worked for 25 years as a composer, sound engineer, and producer, and is at present writing a Bloomsbury book on practical musicology. His books include two co-edited art of record production books, the Bloomsbury Handbook of Music Production and the Musicology of Record Production, which was the winner of the 2015 ISPM Book Prize. We're very um, wonderfully pleased to have um, him with us today. So over to you. An academic presentation wouldn't be an academic presentation without a couple of feeble jokes. And I'll be drawing on my position in popular music studies to do that. So I'm going to start by um, muddying the waters a little bit by introducing some typologies, some what I think of as necessary complications but hopefully I will clear the waters again before too long. So the first necessary complication that I'm going to introduce, um, there are a few definitions about practice and research. And um, I've, uh, the Practice Research Assembly, as we can see from the quote on the right, is a broad church taking in a lot of disciplines. Um, my air is music in which artists can create both artifacts and performances so we can have artifacts like recordings and performances like concerts obviously and within practice as research we're used to that distinction between artifacts and types of output and i would also point to the fact that in areas like composition script writing design and architecture there's a, a third category which is the creation of a, a set of instructions that um, defines how others should produce an artifact um, or a performance or event. So that might be a musical score or a set of plans or drawings or so forth. Okay, so Nelson Goodman introduced the terms um, allographic and autographic to the world of art. Autographic relates to a unique one-off output and allographic relates to artwork that can exist in multiply, multiple equally viable instances. So there's some one some examples on the screen a one-off painting or a book that can be printed as many times as you like so there's a lot of argument about how these terms can leak into each other through concepts like limited editions original manuscripts cover versions the way that repeated events or performances can in introduce differences but while knowledge may be embodied in these outputs practice as researchers i'm sure we're all tired of hearing is about practice or process. And I take a, a tripartite approach to practice research. Artistic, pragmatic and activist is the those three categories that I'm using. So starting with the artistic, I'd characterize this as looking for new ways of saying things through creative practice. Secondly, the pragmatic, we might say it's more about optimizing existing ways of saying things through creative practice. And thirdly, the activist of seeking to produce an effect that extends further than the immediate results of the practice, usually some ethical or ideological goal. And I think, I mean, there could, there's obviously overlap between these categories um, and a single work can encompass more than one or all of them even, but they're useful distinctions for me anyway. So in each case, the quality judgments that are used to assess the research element are often seen as maybe less rigorous or less objective than those established within science and social science. One of the key challenges that practice researchers face. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Sorry? Uh, oh, okay. 
is there is there a technical problem or no okay i'll carry on so um so one of the key challenges that practice researchers face is not simply to produce the research but also to establish the criteria by which it can be judged um, and to produce rigorous and clear formats through which uh, through which those criteria can be judged so a fundamental building block of my approach is that the negotiation and development of those criteria for quality judgment are part of the practice research process um, and I often end up discussing with research colleagues and students about the boundaries between research paradigms and so I've created this little table just to um, make a couple of points so firstly for me the fundamental difference between autoethnographic and practice research is that autoethnography aims to find out how something is done and practice research is about how to do it better or more effectively obviously we can use autoethnographic research to do something better but the principles of research embodied in it are about establishing how something's done and it goes back to what I've just said about the establishment of the criteria for improvement being part of the practice research process but when and how those criteria for judging quality benefit and improvement are set is what I think distinguishes action research and applied research from practice research that flows from the fact that research in those areas mostly establishes measurable quantitative criteria in advance as part of the research question but I would add the caveat that these are blurred boundaries and that there you know there are blurred boundaries between most if not all of these paradigms okay so what is my idea of practice research in the past I've had problems with uh, management's rather grudging acceptance of practice research and a sense that there's there's less rigor and less it's less researchy and that there's a hierarchy with kind of science at the top social sciences under that humanities under that and practices research sort of sitting at the bottom of the rigorous tree um, and so remembering that the the focus is on the practice and not simply the product of the practice for me um, the point about that is you know a chemist working in the pharmaceutical industry doesn't publish a drug as their research output they publish the method for creating the drug and the theory about why the drug works and maybe some clinical trials as evidence that it does work so for our practice to be constituted as research it needs to be focused on the practice and not just the output and it must also provide some combination of method theory and evidence so just to draw on the AHRC's definition of research uh, in the funding guide um, they state that research activities should be primarily concerned with processes rather than outputs and that it's built around three key features um, and it then goes on to define those three features as a research question or issue or problem the research context and research methods so i.e. it answers a question or solves a problem that hasn't already been answered that it creates new knowledge and um, further in that document there are a few other points that are made and although the, the range of outputs that have considered valid as ways valid as ways of communicating that knowledge um, that's been expanded to include as it says here electronic data and so forth um, the important thing is that there should be some benefit or influence i.e. that this new knowledge is transferable and that without these two criteria of it being new knowledge that is transferable and that the knowledge is made explicit in the re research output then it's just practice and not research as it sort of points out in the last of these uh, paragraphs so looking at the parallels with traditional research structures we have a list of elements or processes that I want to think about in terms of practice research so so far so good this is the sort of received wisdom that most if not all of us are familiar with so what am I bringing along that's new interesting or important to this discussion there's a there's a, also there's a lot of received wisdom about what constitutes a good presentation and one of those pearls of wisdom is is focus on three takeaways um, that you want your audience to take away 
And so the three takeaways that I'm going to focus on in this presentation are to look at um, three modes of thought, um, a theoretical model about three modes of thought, the lessons that can be learned from a hypothetical experiment that I, I did about thinking through the process of being a PhD supervisor to some famous practitioners and thinking about the notion of influence as well. And I want to use these three concepts to explore the ideas in my title, the approaches to publishing practices research. But firstly, I want to explain each of these headings. So firstly, this idea of these three modes of thought. So a couple of years ago, I used a 1993 article by popular music scholar Richard Middleton as the starting point for an approach to musical analysis based on the ecological approach to perception and embodied cognition. And my chapter drew on a lot of other work as well, but since then I've also broadened it out and applied it to the ways in which people engage in musical practice. So it's not just analysis anymore. And while there's overlap between these categories that I'm talking about here, We'd, and we're generally engaged in all three at any given moment, I think they, they provide a useful analytical tool. So there are automatic types of activity like reflex, entrainment to a beat, and empathy, and these can either be hardwired or the result of hardwired in the brain. So reflexes work pretty much hardwired from birth, but it takes a while to learn how to tap our feet in time with music, the idea of entrainment. But it seems like a skill that almost everyone has the potential for, that there's something hardwired in the brain that makes it possible. Um, but that we can also learn how to get better at it. Um, then there are the learned subconscious skills that we learn in a, a bottom-up process as we do them over and over again and get more expert at producing the right response from the right stimulus. These patterns get wired into our brain and eventually we get expert enough to do them without thinking. So I can drive home without thinking um, or rather while I'm thinking about other things. I can play a piece, of, uh, a piece on the piano whilst thinking about dynamics and emotion, uh, emotional expression rather than about which finger needs to move where to play the right notes. Or at least I could if I had a bit more time to practice. And finally, um, there are conscious problem solving processes which are top down. They require us to make connections between existing bits of knowledge or experience, identifying similarity, difference and variation between different parts of a piece of music, for instance. OK, so that's what I mean by the three modes of thought. I'm going to come back and refer to them later, but I'm going to go on to the second one. This. Um, Next idea relates to a paper that I gave at the online London Calling Conference last year for the UK and Ireland branch of the International Association for the Study of Popular Music. And it was called, as you can see, Would You Award Björk or Jimi Hendrix a Practice-Led PhD? And it used that conceit to examine the nature of new knowledge in popular music practice. So the conceit involved a fantasy supervision league like a fantasy football league, where I pretended that my current list of PhD students uh, was this, including Hendrix and Joni Mitchell and, um, and others, um, and that I'm a time lord and I can zip back and forth and have supervision meetings with these students at different points in history. And I gave a brief outline of what I would take into each of these supervision meetings so that each of these students <laughs> um, would get on with the effective sharing aspect of their PhD, communicating, an explanation of how their practice constitutes what those of us who've had to deal with the research excellence framework might call the process of investigation leading to new insights. So in each of these instances, I used the three modes of thought that I've just talked about um, and explored how the practicalities of doing what they did could be both contextualized and made better by using theoretical constructs such as intertextuality, opacity, temporality, heteroglossia, flow, and forms of authenticity. Um, so, um, more on that in a moment, but first the last of these three things, 
the third takeaway, the idea of influence. So by uh, using a development of Gibson's ecological approach to perception that relates to perceived possibilities rather than Gibson's physical possibilities, we take as a starting point the, the person who's about to be influenced by something and the possibilities or affordances that they perceive. I've called them affordances for action here, but I would include thought as an action in this instance. It's an activity we engage in and the possibilities for new thoughts are predicated on our existing state of mind. So we have the person who's about to be influenced and a set of possibilities that they can identify as currently available to them. So then if we think about an influencer or as a person or a thing, something that caused an experience for us, and this might happen in real time or it might be a remembered experience, this process of influence results in us perceiving new affordances for thought and action or action. And using this model, we can characterize influence by asking three questions. So what is the stimulus, the experience that changed us, what is the understanding that is altered and what is the new possibility that's recognized so if we jump back to the slide before i started talking about our three takeaways how can we adapt the structures or concepts behind traditional research publishing to practice research and how are those three takeaways going to help then um well i'm going to i'm currently working on a, a new video album project. It's still in the recording and production stage at the moment. So I'm not gonna play you any music until it's a little further along, but I'm experimenting with creating the videos as you can see here um, at the same time as the music. So this is a project based on popular music and jazz. So given that it sits within a world of e extensive existing knowledge, what is it that is new about what I'm doing and one thing that has definitely emerged from the practice research process so far is that the recontextualization of some of the tributaries of 1960s record production mostly coming out of the way that Miles Davis and Tia Macero collaborated these tributaries that were either abandoned or channeled in different directions in the intervening years these I've used these as sort of to create recontextualizations that I think are bearing fruit in terms of how the thing's going to work out. There are other areas in composition and sound to picture video production that I also think will bear fruit, but I'm still clarifying how, both through the production process and through my reflection on it. And the second question um, is how can I communicate and share that new knowledge? And that's these two questions are the things that I want to focus on in the last uh, 15 minutes of the presentation. So let's go through these headings that I pointed out earlier and apply some of the ideas that I've talked about. So I'm going to start by looking at the research question and methodology in relation to the types of output um, that I identified at the start of the talk. And I want to use the metaphor of a journey to do that. Um, these three questions of where where am I going, where do I want to be, how do I get there and how will I know when I'm there if no one else has been there before. And the last part may seem an odd aspect of the metaphor in this sort of modern world but we should remember that you know for example when explorers like Columbus went to circumnavigate the globe they assumed they arrived in some part of India when they'd arrived in the Americas. So they didn't know how to identify their destination. And the question of where do I want to be is usually quite clear in terms of an artifact like this. Although interestingly and perhaps unusually, I thought I was making an audio album when I started this project. Um, and the way that the video element became embedded into the music production ideas emerged later and took me a bit by surprise. But I mean, what is usually more clear is that for example, the, the number of songs, the way we have merged, the way they've merged into a more singular conceptual entity, the musicians who are involved, the arrangements, the lyrics, the music, all the practicalities, but also the more conceptual things, the intertextual ideas, the issues about temporality and opacity. All of these things have been developing and continue to develop. They're not fixed in advance. 
And I also mentioned at the start that the negotiation and development of the criteria for quality judgment are part of the practice research process. And this journey metaphor reflects the fact that even more than in standard quality, qualitative research, the research question is constantly being clarified and revised during the research process. Even when I know where I'm going, there'll be detours for toilets and petrol and food, and I may decide to go to the park and ride instead of the city centre park, car parks. So when I don't know where exactly I'm going and what it looks like, I'm also changing my ideas about what my destination is. And the, um, the research question and the methodology have to embody a recursive process, this reflection and revision of my judgment of what constitutes a good outcome and how that can be achieved. So the old adage that a, an artist doesn't finish a piece so much as stop working on it is uh, sort of partially true here, but it's also complicated by restrictions imposed, imposed by deadlines, budgets, quantity of work. And this is also even further complicated by the distinctions that I made in terms of practice of research, where there are certain elements that might be pragmatic or activist as well as artistic. Okay, so to move on to literature review, what the earlier, this is what the earlier ARC, AHRC definitions more broadly referred to as the research context. Um, of course, an academic practitioner needs to be immersed in the theoretical literature that helps to define their subject area. And the supervising stars idea is, on, on the one hand, a kind of technical exercise for building the bridges between the academic literature and practice. Obviously, these are all books. The only reason I'm not showing journal articles and videos of things is that they don't make for an easily structured slide. But on the other hand, the supervising stars idea also produces a kind of back catalogue of examples and researchers and students can develop these for themselves, a set of templates for dealing with the sort of how to ideas. I think it's a it's a useful tool in that regard. And in the fantasy supervision league paper that I use, I use the three modes of thought to explore how, for example, Björk's vocal performance technique might emerge through demonstration, documentation of the process and reflection on that. And with Janelle Monet and Kini Shukichi and uh, Katano Veloso, I use various aspects of intertextuality to explore the mechanisms and motivations for influence. What were the influence? How did you understand change? And what new possibilities did you identify? Um, in terms of uh, opacity, how's the visibility of effort or concentration important in Hendrick's performance? Um, with Joni Mitchell's use of guitar tunings or Ty's use of backing tracks to develop vocal performances, how does the use of instrument, instrument or production technology affect the timbre or the micro timing of the performance? And how does it? How do you use that to develop a piece or a performance? And when you're a, a virtu, virtuoso guitarist in a covers band, the Courtney Cox here is not the one you might be thinking of, but this is uh, one of a band called the Iron Maidens, who are a tribute band to Iron Maiden. Um, how do you balance the twin authenticities of being true to the original band and also an expressive performer in her own right? And so these examples provide the opportunity to think both about what the theoretical construct should be and how they might be documented. And they contribute both to research context and to the methodology, methodology in that regard. So as we move on to the data management, the gathering, the measurement and analysis, what are the metaphors for that or what are the parallels for that? These are informed by methodology, but are constituted by the methods. And what I want to talk about here are the methods we can use for documenting and representing practice. So obviously there are a bunch of technical mechanisms, these multimedia technologies that we're all getting to grips with and fighting with in some instances. But I want to think about the conceptual categories that the documentation and representation falls into. So this is a work in progress for me, and it it's currently just a preliminary set of ideas, but I've identified uh, these four categories as a starting point. So a temporal focus, a spatial focus, focus, deconstruction, 
and our internal narrative. So I'll just go through those. So by a temporal focus, I mean documentation and representation methods that use time as a structuring principle and or manipulate temporal relationships to bring out ideas. So the most obvious perhaps is the idea of a timeline as a structuring principle, representing your practice based on the order in which it happened. So this might be a literal timeline or it might be a series of snapshots like uh, these file, these session files from my album that I saved versions with new date stamps when something that felt significant changed so that I can go through the process in a, in a time-based way and I can document it in that way. Um, varying the, the speed of playback, so either in this example with time-lapse but also with slow motion, provides another temporal perspective that can encourage different forms of interpretation and thirdly there's, uh, oh, this is a Cuban project that I was involved with Sarah McGuinness on and, um, and thirdly a, a schematic representation of time, of phases of activity that are on the one hand a basic form, well they are a basic form of interpretation of what happened and they're a practice akin to the thematic coding of interviews in the social sciences I would say. Okay and then with the spatial focus this is the idea of documenting and representing with a spatial focus not just observing something over time but observing the same phenomenon from a variety of perspectives. So just as we can play back media at different speeds we can zoom in and out to view more detail or the bigger picture and this bit of video is from one of the first recording sessions on the album I'm working on with uh, this Congolese guitarist Kianfu Kasongo and you can see me directing him but if you zoom in you can get a better idea of what his hands are doing so it's about changing the the spatial perspective of the data if you like and the second feature is the idea of using some form of schematic representation so in this example to demonstrate how the editing process translates temporal information into spatial into the spatial realm on a computer screen and how that can be used to create new musical relationships in this case talking about either predictive or responsive um, relationships uh, and then this idea of multiple perspectives perhaps you know the obvious example of this would be having several camera angles filming the same um, thing but in the recording world we also do the same by capturing the same performance with multiple microphones these are tracks of audio um, Sorry, my dog's having a nightmare in the background and he's barking in his sleep um, that's not loud or disturbing um, as you'll see in a minute there were two drummers playing in the room but they were recorded with 16 separate microphones each with a different spatial relationship to a different part of the drum kit this is kind of normal creative practice but it also provides opportunities for a spatial analysis or an analysis of the um, of the work so thirdly we have this notion of deconstruction of something that crosses over with the various schematic and structural representations that we've talked about but which is about for me is about re-representing information in a different way that brings out or allows us to find relationships or features that weren't visible in the raw data if you like so for example I might simplify a complex set of interactions into categories in, in this instance um, categories of influence of what happened and uh, of sorry of when something happened and who it was so I might create a, a, a sort of thematic analysis of, of some of my video data by looking at you know did this happen before the performance started during the performance or in an editing process afterwards and who was it that suggested it. Um, we can also create multimodal representations that combine complex information from different types of sensory information so here we can see the 16 channels that we've already saw plus some split green split screen footage of the two drummers so the deconstruction process can either create something that's simplified like the schematic uh, like the categories that I was talking about or more complex like this multimodal um, perception and another technique um, that popular music scholar Phil Tagg uses or, or has uh, promoted is the idea of sus 
substitution or commutation. So either a, a, a process of hypothetical or real substitution to see what the effect is. Imagining, in this example, the same melody on a trumpet or on a saxophone and imagining how it affects our interpretation. So obviously this kind of process of hypothetical substitution is something that we do all the time in practice but therefore it needs to be formalized into the documentation process. It's part of our created practice but it's an internal process usually so we need to find ways of formalizing it and putting it into um, publications about this stuff. So the fourth of these methods is the creation or documentation of our internal narrative and the, the first two of these are well established techniques drawn from ethnography and autoethnography keeping some kind of reflective diary or in the um, in the example of stimulated recall of using some documentation of the process to then revisit it and ask questions about it to stimulate our recall and to stimulate fresh interpretations so this is all um, kind of relatively common methodology but the third is that of goal identification and it re relates back to the practice research process of identifying the criteria for quality judgments and the goals that would be associated with them and this should be formalized in the methodology and should be regularly assessed and documented about you know what have I well going back to what I was talking about before about where am I going and how am I getting there and when am I gonna recognize when I'm there okay so the last of these things is the idea of, of how we write conclusions about practice research and uh, distinctions that I outlined between various paradigms at the start of the talk point to some what I think are quite hard questions that as practice researchers we need to uh, to confront um, in asking the question of what types of new knowledge can emerge from practice research um, uh, before I do that I'd like to highlight three things and these things are firstly if the final artifact or performance conveys the knowledge without any need for further explanation then I think that constitutes just creative, creative practice there needs to be some form of exegesis for this to be practice research secondly we face the same conceptual problems about generalizing out from case studies that other disciplines do and we need to think about what this means about the way we extrapolate new knowledge thirdly is the question of how transferable knowledge we produce is different to that of ethnographers because I think quite often there's um, a bit of uh, crossover here so I would say that um, the generalized forms of practice n research knowledge these four things the relationship between problem solving and technical skill is one thing that we can explore the relationship between the development and emergence of quality judgments and methods the complex aesthetic relationship between the expected and the unexpected in our practice the mechanisms for creating metaphors relating theory to artistic pragmatic or activist practice and these are all shaped by this ongoing requirement to develop the criteria for quality judgments as part of the research process and that they require three things a theoretical model about thought that allows us to theorize our practice and or creativity ways of linking theoretical ideas to creative practice and a theory of influence that can be used to define the research context as well as the development of both the quality judgments and the methods in short we need these three takeaways again this uh, uh, cheesy joke sorry um, okay that's uh, me done